Fox. Waiting for my wireless mic, so I'm going to speak from here till I get that. A uh, couple of announcements before we start. One is your cases should all be back to you. If you haven't got the case back, then you need to let me know because it's entirely possible. I think there were 86 cases. I, you know, I might have missed a, missed one right there in the middle. But um, everything in the case should be in the comments in your in your uh, in your Acrobat files, uh, the the PDF files. But look in the first the cover page because that's the page above the grade. You'll see the code, and I gave you the coding. So check check and make sure that I was fair. A okay. fair, not. Just, you know, so when, when you check through and you say, well, that's not true, we did that. No, we did capital maintenance. Um, check and if, if I miss something, bring it in and I'll take another look at the case, okay? That's the first thing. Second is things start piling up. So the next quiz is day after tomorrow. First 30 minutes of class, it'll cover chapters. The remaining portion of chapter four, which is getting from cost of equity to cost of capital. All of chapter 5 and chapter 6, which is you know, capital budgeting. In fact, if you take a look at the case, it's in a sense a microcosm of everything that is going to be on the quiz, which is good news if you are very involved in your case. It's bad news if you are not. Okay? But if so, if you are not involved in the number crunching in the case, you, tell you had a division of labor, somebody else crunched the numbers, you might want to take a look at how we went from revenues to operating income to cash flows because that is the process by which you always do capital budgeting. So it's, it's essentially a capital budgeting quiz, which is also a test of some basic accounting. If you really have trouble between, in differentiating between operating income and net income, this quiz is going to trip you up. Right, because you need to be able to at least work with. I mean, I mean, you don't have to do debit credits. I'm not asking for financial statement analysis, but you need to understand the basics of accounting. Okay. You don't have a whole lot of time to catch up on it, but I have an accounting primer on my website that you can check out. But you can also check out the number crunching that you did on the Nike case and my solution to that case. Okay. After class today, I will send you an email with the seating arrangements for the next for the quiz. Okay. It will not be the same as the first quiz because otherwise I get complaints that you were consigned to one room or the other for all three quizzes, so I try to rotate through. It's not completely fair because some of you might get to be in 260 tw two times out of three. Some might be, you know, because it's not exa easy to get exactly the right number, but I will try to rotate through. So you are in different rooms for different quizzes. So I will send that, that email out after class today. The review session is tomorrow from 12 to 1. As I said, it's your only time, especially as you get to the weekdays. It's not a Friday. It's very difficult to get this room. So it's 12 to 1 in this room tomorrow. It will be webcast. Hopefully, they'll get it all working exactly the way it should. And if I'm lucky, I should be able to get it out, the, the webcast link to you about an hour, hour and a half after the class is over. Okay. Any questions before we start? I also got a few emails over the weekend after I sent out the case solution asking where, what the distribution of scores in the case were, was. I, was I, I could have sent that with the original quiz. I kind of held back on it because I don't want people to read too much into it because the distribution is obviously not going to be, no, it's, it's out of 10. I think the worst case score was a six and a half. The best, of course, was a 10. There are only five tens in the whole class, so out of the 86 cases. Okay, so I'll say, I, I know you'll harass me until I do this, so I'm going to, I'll send out the distribution, but there'll be no letter grade. I'll just send you the, the, the score distribution so you can see what the histogram looks like. But as I said, don't read too much into it and say, we got an A or an A minus. It's just going to give you the distribution of scores on the, on the, on the case. Okay, so ready? Let's get started. There's one final. One final loose end that I want to tie up with on capital budgeting. Okay? So far in capital budgeting, investment analysis, we've looked at assessing a new investment, something that you haven't decided on yet, like the Nike apparel case. Should you do it? Shouldn't you do it? So we looked at the basic principles. The basic principles are very simple. Be consistent. 
Consistent in what sense? Consistent the way you define cash flows and the way you come up with the discount rate. If your cash flows are cash flows after debt payments, your discount rate has to be a cost of equity. If your cash flows are before debt payments, the discount rate has to be a cost of capital. If your cash flows are in dollars, your discount rate has to be in dollars. Okay. So that consistency principle is the first one. The second, we said, was look at incremental cash flows. The idea being you do not want to reject a project because of something that's already been done. So we talked about sunk costs and non-incremental g &A. So let's say you do everything right. You make an analysis, you come up with a net present value. You say, take the project. You turn it over to the people running the project. Now it's two years into the project. You look back at the project. So what I want to talk about, and this is the final piece, is what do you do about projects you've already taken, investments you've already made? Because okay? the rules don't change. You still focus on incremental cash flows, but now a big chunk of the money is a sunk cost. right? So if I look at Nike Apparel, four years into the process, after I've invested in Nike Apparel, that two billion, two and a half billion I've invested is already gone. So I'm going to lay out the principles, and you shouldn't be surprised to see the same principles kick in. Jump up there. Excuse me. I'm going to fall over, and I'll sue the school for this. But... Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> so here are, the, here are the two things I want to talk about. One is you can look at an investment you've already made as a postmodern. You say, why do that? It's too late. You're right, it's too late to change the investment. But maybe you can change something about the way you do estimation by looking at your mistakes. Okay? So, so that's the first thing I want to talk about. But then I also want to talk about a more critical question. It is true you cannot do much about an investment you've already made. But maybe there's something you can do next that will increase your value to, a comp to the company. Saying, so what could I do next? Maybe this investment is so bad, now you should shut it down. It was a good investment when you assessed it, but things have changed around you. Maybe you could divest this investment, sell it to somebody else. Or maybe you should just continue this investment with some changes made to it. So let's start with the process itself. So you're basically, you, there was your initial investment. Now you're two years into the project. So you've got two years of actual numbers come in. Those actual numbers might be greater than your expected numbers, in which case you're happy, or they could be much lower than your expected numbers, in which case you're worried. Okay? So there's where you are. You're trying to decide what to do next. So let's look at the four choices you will have. Okay? As you look at the numbers, and you look at the actual numbers versus expected numbers, the first thing you have to ask yourself is, why are my numbers off? So if I look at your Nike apparel numbers, three or four years in, not, those numbers are different from the actual numbers. One reason they'll be off is because of pure fit. Nothing to do with your estimation abilities. Things change. You cannot forecast everything that's going to happen. So if in 2007 you'd made an assessment of a project, and you got to 2008, you had the banking crisis, everything's going to come apart. I can't take it out and say, you made a mistake. So some of this is chance. And some of this is bias. You know what I mean by bias? You like the apparel project so much, you pumped up the numbers. That's very difficult to separate the two, right? So all I see is actual numbers be different from expected numbers. If I ask you why, let's, let's take the bad case scenario. Actual numbers came in below the expected numbers. You made the original estimates and ask you what went wrong. You know what you're going to tell me, right? It's all fake. It's not my mistake. And if it's just one investment, I really have no way of disproving you. But let's say you've done numbers for 10 different investments at 10 different points in time, and on every one of them, the actual numbers came in below the expected numbers. Now I'm getting a little suspicious when you say chance. Chance on one is okay. Chance on two, maybe. If you think about 50-50 chances, chance on three, you're getting pushing the limits. Chance on 10 in a row. So when you look across investments and you see the numbers consistently come in below or above expectations, you know there's bias built into the process. What are you going to do about it? Well, I might fire you. That might start the process. But it might not just be you. The process itself might be screwed up. There's actually substantial evidence out there that when people do capital budgeting, the people projecting the numbers are people who should not be projecting the numbers. 
They're the people who love the project. This is why an acquisition valuation, if you turn the number crunching over to the deal makers, the investment bankers and the people pushing for the deal, of course they're going to come up with upward bias. It's not because they're bad people, but if you're biased in this process, the bias is going to find its way into the cash flows. So if you're a company that wants to fix this problem, you have to consistently revisit your forecasts and look at the actual numbers. Not because you're morbid, but because you want to learn from the process and make your estimation much better. If you're a company that grows through acquisitions, take a look at your forecast for the cash flows and the actual cash flows and see if you can learn something about making future forecasts. So what, that's what I mean about postmortem is learning something from this process. You don't repeat it on the next one. The second part of the analysis, though, is to me the more interesting one. So you're two years into the project, right? So what's already happened has happened. So now I ask you, what should I do next? And here are your four choices. You have eight more years left on this project, right? You can take the present value of those cash flows for the remaining eight years. With those cash flows now altered to reflect what you learned in the first two. So it's not the original year's forecast you're looking at anymore. It's your updated forecast. Let's say this project has done so horribly over the first two years that when you project out the remaining eight years, they're all negative cash flows. Your job became very simple. It's not an easy job, but it became very simple. If your present value of the remaining cash flows on this project are less than zero, then just shut the project down, liquidate it. There's no point continuing a project even though it might have looked great two years ago, if it no longer stands the test. So the present value of the cash flows, of the future cash flows you've come up with, is less than zero, you terminate the project, or liquidate the project. If you have a salvage value that is actually out there, so if you could sell this project, let's say there's land under the factory, and you can sell it, and the present value of the cash flows is less than land, then selling the land and shutting down the factory is still better for you than continuing the project. So just because a project looked good two years ago doesn't mean you should keep doing it now, now that you've got this updated set of cash flows. Which means investment analysis is never, ever quite done, right? So you do the investment analysis, you make that first decision. You should revisit that project every year to see what to do next. And the last two become more interesting. If you do the present value of the cash flows, and let's say you come up with six billion, you heave a sigh of relief, this is good. But then you see that there's somebody else out there who's willing to pay you more than six billion for the project. Even though you love this project, you want to hold on to it, you are better off, at least from a, from a company perspective, selling that project to that person and claiming the two billion dollar difference. Why might somebody be willing to more, pay more than the present value, the cash flows? Uh, what are some of the reasons? Sorry, go ahead, I can't even hear you. Synergies. They might see benefits in this as part of their business that, they don't, that you can't get. So it could be synergies. What else? Could it be efficiency that they could run this project more efficiently? Maybe they know this business better, so it could be efficiencies. You know, the distinction between synergies and efficiencies is synergies are combining with something else. Efficiencies stand alone. So it could be a KKR looking at this business saying, we can run this business much more efficiently than you can. Could it be stupidity? Let's say this division is a social media division. Everybody's overpaying. You take advantage of it. In fact, I'll give you an example where overpayment can be feed in. Let's suppose you have a factory on a piece of real estate, but real estate prices are rising. People might be willing to pay more than the present value of the cash flows because they're building into what they're paying, whatever the overpayment is. So if there's somebody out there willing to pay more than the present value of the cash flows, let it go. Easier said than done because the CEO might love this division. He says, I don't want to let it go. But from your stockholder's perspective, it's better to let it go. And there's one, one final, it, it, it says, uh, you know, there's one final solution here, which is you come up with a value that is greater than the divestiture value. So you're, you know, but it's, but it's also, in, the, in this case, if it's greater than zero, but it's, you can't sell it. You, it's worth more to you than to somebody else. Then you continue the project. So I'm going to take a, a real example to bring this home. How many of you have been to California Adventure theme park right across from Disneyland? Okay. This, it, it's a fairly of recent vintage. I don't know what, 12, 15? It's, it's about a decade old. 
Okay? Originally, all you had in Anaheim was Disneyland. They built California Adventure right across the walk space on the other side of the... So it's, you can walk over. It's a two-minute walk. And when they originally built it, they built it on the assumption that all these people would come to Disneyland, about 70% would cross that brick walkway and go to California Adventure. And for a while, it looked like they might pull it off, but it turned out that a lot of people who went to Disneyland were not coming over to California Adventure. So this has been a problem for Disney. For the last decade, they've been wanting to get people over, but people are not coming over. So California Adventure standing alone is getting only about 60, if you look at the actual numbers, only of the 15 million people, only 6 million, 30% of, what is it, 40%, or 40% are coming over to California. So the actual numbers are coming in well below expectations. If you look at the cash flow, it's about 50 million between 2001 and 2007, which was less than the 100 million that they originally forecast. So right now, here's where you are. You're making about 50 million dollars a year when you should be making, when you thought you'd be making 100 million, and you're facing some choices as it is. And here are your choices. One is you can shut down California Adventure and try to recover what you invested in. The only problem is you're not going to get your entire investment back. You can recover only about a half a billion of that investment. So your first choice is to shut things down, get a half a billion back. Second is continue with the status quo and make 50 million a year. Let's assume you make that as your growing perpetuity. The third choice is to invest more money into California Adventure. You think, that's stupid. If you're not making money, why would you do that? The hope here is if you build rides in California Adventure that attract people with young kids, that more people would come, come across from Disneyland into California Adventure. And let's say if you invest about 600 million, you can increase the percentage of people coming to California Adventure from 40 back to 60 percent, and your after-tax cash flow will go from 50 to 80 million. So you have three choices. Shut it down and make 500 million. Continue the project as is and make 50 million, you know, growing with, as a book. And the third is Invest $600 million more and try to increase your cash flows. Let's see which of these choices make the most sense. If you continue as is, I'm going to assume the 2% inflation rate built into the cash flows, $50 million growing at 2% a year, the 6.62% is the theme park cost of capital, gives me a value for the theme park of $1.1 billion. So continued as is, the theme park has a value of $1.1 billion. What would I get if I shut the theme park down? Half a billion. So clearly that choice is already out of the window. So the choice now is, should we keep doing what we're doing and have a value of 1.1 billion? Or should we invest another 600 million and increase my uh, your cash flows by 30 million? If you look at the increase in cash flows, 30 million. Present value of just that increase of 30 million is 662 million. You invest 600 million, you get back 662 million. That gives you a net present value on the expansion <laughs> of 62 million. So your three choices are do nothing and make 1.16 billion as a continuing value. Second is shut it down and make 500 million. And the third is invest another 600 million and increase your cash flows or your present value by 62 million. At least based on the numbers. It looks like Disney should invest the 600 million and hope to get that 60% increase. Of course, they could be wrong on that estimate too. And guess what they actually ended up doing? They've actually ended up spending a lot of money on California Adventure. They've added like five different rides in the last three years. That is the 600 million that you're seeing going into the theme park. They've clearly chosen the third option. I'm sure now at Disney there are people down on their knees saying, please, let's see more people come into this theme park because if you invest the extra 600 million and you still stay stuck at 500 million, then you have some serious problems with what you've done. So my, my general point is just because a big investment has already been made, you don't give up on it. You keep assessing the cash flows and deciding what to do next. And all too often, companies get into the inertia. We made the investment, we're going to let it go, even if it's a bad investment. But there are things you might be able to do that increase your value or increase the value to your stockholders. So it took us a while to get to the end of the first packet. Let's wrap up. Let me restate the investment principle. You want to invest in projects that earn a return greater than your minimum acceptable hurdle rate. The cost of capital was that minimum acceptable hurdle rate. That hurdle rate reflects the riskiness of the investments and where you got the money. The returns, which is what we spent the last few sessions on, should be based on incremental cash flows, 
should reflect when you get those cash flows and should have all side effects, strategic side costs, side benefits, all built into it. So that's the investment principle. It's a starting point for everything we do in corporate finance. If you make bad investment decisions, then the rest is kind of history. You really can't do much. So this principle to me is the key principle in running a business. Make good investments. Everything else will take care of itself. Okay? So this is the first step in the process. Any questions on the investment principle? Yes? Do you have any threshold uh, above you, you would invest? Like it says like 5% increase in this rate. To me, it's not like you want the risk. The question is, is there any threshold, any minimum increase? Anything greater than zero is a good starting point. If it becomes a mutually exclusive decision, if you can give me three choices, of course, I'll go with the highest one. So if you give me three choices, you can do one which increases my value by 5%, one by 11%, one by 23%, of course, I'd like the 23% more. But if you're a mature company, 5% might be the best you can do. If you turn that away saying it's too little, that money goes back into your cash balance, which is a 0% increase. So it's true, we'd much rather have bigger increases than smaller increases in value, but when you're a big company, you have to do it incrementally. It's, this investment might add only 3%, but if you do things right, if you're unbiased, and you can do five of these investments in a year, that's your excess returns for the year. So you, got, it, it, you really can't do much about it. So if you take, a, now Apple is a good example. Okay? If you look at the iPad 3, the incremental effect of the iPad 3 is far smaller than the iPhone or the iPad. It, partly because of their own success. As you get bigger, each new investment is going to have a smaller and smaller impact. But you still have to make investments based on the same principle, adding value. Because if you get impatient, you know what you're going to do, right? How does a big company add a lot of value or try to add a lot of value? They do an acquisition. I'd much rather that you be careful and take small investments and do them incrementally than to do that acquisition and try to get the increase in value in a hurry. But it's reality. The more successful you get, the more difficult it's going to be for you to have that blockbuster investment, investment that explodes the value of your company because you're already a big company. Okay. Any other questions on the investment principle? Yes? Um, could you explain why they shouldn't just continue with that? Okay, on this one? Yeah. Here are the three choices. They can shut down half a billion. They can continue 1.1 billion. If I gave you just those two choices, you just continue, right? Now I give you a third choice. You can invest an extra 600 million and increase your cash flows by 30 million a year. So that's almost like an additional new project. So if you look at investing 600 million, what you get back as the present value of the cash flows from just the additional investment is 662 million. In fact, the way to think about this is if you put this entire option in, that 662 million difference gets added on top of the 1.1 billion. So you really have three choices, 500 million, 1.1 billion, or 1.16 billion. You're going to go with the 1.16 billion because it delivers the highest increase in value. Any other questions? Okay. So let's shut this packet down and start on the second one. Did you guys bring the second packet? If you didn't, not a big deal, because, but you need it sooner rather than later. So this packet, we're going to cover the rest of the class, financing, dividend policy, and valuation. Okay. So let's start with the financing principle. Basically, the question we're asking is, up till now, when we looked at cost of capital, we've taken the debt ratio as a given. For Disney, it was, what, 27% debt, 73% equity. We didn't stop and ask, was that the right mix? And if you're working along on your project and your company might have no debt, you just took that debt ratio, your cost of equity was your cost of capital, and you moved on. So what we're going to stop and do at this stage in the process is ask, was that the right thing for Disney to do? Should they have used more debt or should they have used less debt? And this is actually a fairly tricky place to be because if you think about debt, debt historically at least has not been viewed as a good thing. I mean, lots of religions actually have built in premises against borrowing money. Okay? It's viewed as almost not just financially imprudent, but sinful. And I mean, there are all kinds of things attached to debt that have kind of come into this decision. You're saying, well, that's, you know, there are people who actually run businesses because they are affected by those early lessons they got about debt. In finance, obviously, we don't view debt as sinful. We view it as a source of financing. 
So what I'd like to talk about now is the financing principle. The mix of debt and equity that you should use to run the business. So let's, let me state the principle and, and focus on what I'm going to talk about first. I'm going to talk about the mix of debt and equity for a company. What is the right mix? I'm going to use the word optimal, but I'm going to use, use it guardedly because we're going to make estimates, we can make judgments on what's optimal, but we're going to see if there's a right mix of debt and equity for a business. And then we're going to follow up by asking what the right kind of debt for your company is. So let's start with that first question today. What's the right mix of debt and equity for your business? Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say the right mix of debt and equity for every business. It's for each business. So let's start the process by first re, 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 you know, going back to a definition of debt and equity that we laid out up front, but make sure that we get it nailed down. Two ways to raise money to run, to run a business. You can borrow the money or use your own money. The key distinctions between debt and equity. Debt, you get a fixed claim on the cash flows. Equity, you get whatever's left over. Debt is tax deductible. Equity is not. Debt gets the highest priority. If you get into financial trouble, you go bankrupt. Debt holders get the first claim. Equity investors get the last claim. Debt generally has a fixed maturity. 10, 20, 50 years. Equity usually comes with no finite maturity. So when you buy stock in a publicly traded company, there's no due date, no end date on it. And finally, generally speaking, when you, borrow, when you lend money to a company, you get no role in how the company is run. But when you buy equity in the company, you get a say in how the company is run. So that's the distinction that separates debt from equity. Right? And that's a distinction we talked about earlier when we talked about cost of capital. So let's look at some general facts about debt and equity before we dive in and look at the right mix of debt and equity. This is actually a table that breaks down how companies in different parts of the world raise money. And I've actually looked at three ways you can raise money. One is what I call internal equity, which is retained earnings, which is really equity but coming from within the firm. The second is New debt issues, net debt, the reason I call it net is debt issues minus debt repaid. So it's a net debt added on. And the third is net equity, which is equity issued minus equity buybacks. So let's take a country where the numbers actually are easy to look at. Let's take Japan. Japan, about 50% of the funds for projects come from retained earnings. So that's the first way. About 40% come from net debt, about 10% come from equity. So at least in Japan, if you look at the breakdown, 60% comes from equity, internal so retained earnings and the new equity, and the rest comes from debt. If you look at, at, at France, France has the highest proportion of net equity, new equity issues. It's a, almost, it's a little higher than the net debt, and the rest from retained earnings. But Japan, through, and, you know, if you look at these six countries, you can see the breakdown is between net debt, net equity, and internal financing. Take a look at the United States, though. This is over the last, over in, in this period, 84 through 91. If you look at the breakdown, first, the net equity is a negative number. What does that mean? What did I say net equity was? It's a difference between equity issues and equity buybacks. Between 84 and 91, season, publicly traded companies actually took equity out of the business rather than put equity in. I don't have an updated version of this graph, but if you look over the last 25 years in the U.S., this has generally been true for large to mid-sized U.S. companies, is they've been taking more equity out of the business than putting equity in. They still, some still reinvest their retained earnings, obviously, but new equity issues are overwhelmed by stock buybacks. Okay. Something to file away, because in many of those other countries, stock buybacks were unheard of, 84 through 91. Now you're starting to see the beginnings of stock buybacks even in other countries. So it'll be interesting to see how the financing in these countries evolves as stock buybacks become more common. Here's a second factor to keep in mind. When you look at how companies borrow money in the U.S. versus the rest of the world, and this is again an old graph that might need to be updated, a bigger proportion of borrowing in the U.S. takes the form of corporate bonds than in any other part of the world. Most of the parts of the world, if you look at debt still, it takes the form of bank loans. Okay? So corporate bonds are uniquely U.S. phenomenon that have now spread to other parts of the world. So you now see more bond issues in Europe. You're starting to see bond issues in Asia and Latin America. But even now, if you look at the breakdown, 
You have far more coming from bonds in the US than in any other country. So let's look at the three companies we're going to assess debt ratios on. Let's see where they are right now, what they have on their books. So what I did was I took the debt that Disney, Aura Cruz, and Tata Chemicals have right now, and that's the amount of debt they have, 13.27 US billion dollars in US dollars. Aura Cruz is 24.2 billion nominal reais, and Tata Chemicals is 42.22 billion rupees in debt. I've broken the debt down into how much take the form of bonds, which in the case of Disney is almost all of the debt. The red is the bonds, and the blue is the bank loans. But if you look at Aura Cruz, all the debt is bank loans, and Tata Chemicals is just a sliver of bonds. Most of it's debt. So it kind of confirms what you saw in the previous graph. US companies, especially large ones, are more likely to be bond issuers. I then broke the debt down by maturity. So the blue is short-term debt, the red is one to five-year debt, the green is uh, 5 to 10, and the purple is more than 10 years. For Disney, about a quarter of its debt is more than 5-year debt. It's long-term debt. If you look at Ara Cruz and Tata Chemicals, there's almost no debt that is more long-term than 5 years. And that's not unusual. In many emerging markets still, banks will refuse to lend for extended periods. In Brazil, after the inflation fiasco in the 1990s, the longest term loans dropped about two to three years because no bank wanted to be stuck with loans that went 10, 15, 20 years at an interest rate they had to set up front. It's a lot of short term debt. Then I broke down the other characteristics of the debt. Disney had significant lease commitments, and we talked about converting the lease commitments to debt. Our accrues, I would, I would say, has no lease commitments, but I'm going to be careful. There's no stated lease commitments. So, then, so I, for all I know, they might have significant lease commitments, but they're not telling me what, because in many countries, this is not required. You don't have to tell me what your lease commitments are. And Tata Chemicals has tiny lease commitments. Long-term leases in much of India are still unusual, so you don't have as many big long-term commitments over, of lease commitments over long periods. Disney, 76% of the debt is fixed rate debt, which means the interest rate was set at the time of the, of the borrowing. 24% is floating rate debt, where the interest rate is tied to LIBOR or prime or some government bond rate, so changes on a period-to-period -period basis. If you look at our accrues, 100% of the debt is fixed rate debt. There's no floating rate debt, and so is, the, and so is Tata Chemicals debt. It's all fixed rate debt. If you look at currencies for Disney, 90% of the debt is US dollar debt. At least in the time that I looked at it, 10% was Japanese yen debt. There's no euro debt, there's no rei debt, there's no rupee debt, there's no, no, there was no other currency debt. Okay? Remember, we're laying the, the foundation for asking the question, is this the right kind of debt for the company? You can already see the beginnings of places you might disagree with what Disney is doing. Say, how come you have only Japanese yen debt? How come no European debt? And if you look at our accrues, 100% of the debt is rei debt. What does our accrues do again? It's a paper and pulp company that sells into a dollar-based market, right? So again, you might say, hey, why just REI debt? Why not some dollar debt reflecting the fact that your revenues are all in dollars? And if you look at Tata Chemicals, 97% of the debt is rupee debt. 3% is US dollar debt. In fact, that, see that sliver of debt that you see there is bonds? Those are all the bonds they've issued outside India. So many of these companies, when they issue bonds, often choose to issue them, at least until recently, they choose to issue them in the U.S., where the bond market tends to be more liquid and perhaps more amenable to these bond issues. Final feature, 43% of Disney's debt is callable. What does that mean? Callable by whom? When you see callable bonds, the option to call rests with the company or with the bond buyer. It rests with the company, right? And why might a company want to call back debt? Because when you call back debt, you've got to pay the face value of the bonds to the people, right? So why would a company want to have this option of callable debt? If interest rates go down, you want to call back the debt that you had at high interest rates and replace it with low. A lot of corporate bonds in the U.S. are callable precisely for that reason. And if you carry that to the next step, if you look at a U.S. company then that borrows through bonds, you almost never will see bonds borrowed at a high interest rate that stay on the books if interest rates have come down because you can always replace the debt with lower cost debt. So 43% of the debt is callable. 10% of the bonds are puttable. The callable option rests with the company. The puttable option rests with the bond buyer.
You say, why would you want to put the bonds back? Remember the Nabisco fiasco where the, those, those Nabisco bond holders got messed up because they didn't leverage buyout? And I said, after Nabisco, a lot of bonds had put options put into them. Here's, here's the Nabisco effect playing out at Disney. 10% of the bonds are portable. So if you own one of these bonds, and if Disney does a leverage buyout, you can turn the bonds over and get your face value back. A very small portion of our accruces debt is convertible debt, converted to equity. Most of the bank loans are term loans. You know what term loans are? You pay off the debt in equal annual installments. So each payment will include both interest and principal. It's a pretty standard characteristic of bank loans. As opposed to what? Balloon payment loans, so you pay only interest. A corporate bond is a balloon payment loan. You pay only interest for the period that you have the bond, then you pay the face value at the end. And all of Tata Chemical's bank debt is term loans. So this is, if there's nothing you can read off this page other than what, is, what are these companies doing right now, and some of it reflects the, the differences in where they're incorporated and in trade. U.S. companies have more options, of, at least historically have had more options on where to go to borrow money. So let's start this process of thinking about what the right mix of debt and equity is. And I think the easiest way to think about this choice is to think in terms of a life cycle. Companies go through life cycles just like human beings do. You have young startup companies. Right? Young startup companies, you've got an idea, you're trying to make that idea into a commercial product. The funding should be almost entirely equity. Do you see why? You might choose to borrow money from the bank, but you have, you have nothing to make interest payments on. So when you start a business, if you get desperate, you might take a bank loan and try to fund it, but you're not funding it with the business. So if you were looking at it from pure corporate finance basics, a startup business should be funded almost entirely with equity. So you have that idea. The idea becomes a commercial product. It succeeds. You start growing. Your revenues start growing. Your income might not have kicked in yet, and your cash flows are definitely going to be negative. You see why even though you might be making money, because you're growing, you'll be reinvesting substantial amounts. The last thing you want to do is worry about making interest payments. So as you get to the second stage, you're still looking at primarily or entirely equity. You might decide to go public, like many of the social media companies are. But remember, you still have the same issues as a young growth company. You have negative cash flows. So even if you choose to go public, it's almost entirely equity. Then you keep growing. Your revenues keep growing, but now your earnings start to catch up. You're starting to have healthy margins. But as you grow, your reinvestment opportunities also start to drop off. So it's a combination. Your earnings are improving. You're reinvesting uh, less. You start to see the opening up between the two numbers. That's when your capacity to borrow money first starts to show up. You might not exploit it because you still want to be a young growth company. But if you don't borrow money and that cash coming in exceeds the reinvestment needs, that cash goes into your cash balance. Your cash balance starts to build up. At some stage in the process, you're going to start to see pressure from below. You know, when you're first disappointing year in terms of earnings, somebody's going to say, hey, how come you have all this money and you're not borrowing any money? How come you're not taking advantage of that tax benefit from debt? You might fight it for two years, three years. Eventually, though, you have to wake up to the fact that you now have debt capacity. You've chosen not to use it so far, but now this might be the way you increase your stock prices by borrowing money. Your mature company, I would expect to see much more debt on your balance sheet. Then you get to be a declining company. Your revenues start to drop off. You really don't have great prospects. Your capacity to pay, pay off cash flows increases. You might get even more levered as you find, find, basically fi finance your way to liquidation. So when you tell me where you are in the life cycle as a company, I should be able to guess whether you have a lot of debt, not much debt, or no debt at all, because that's what I would expect given where you're in the life cycle. What you actually have is debt might be very different from what I expect you to have, but that's, I think, the beginning of this process is to look for those mismatches. So if you look at this life cycle, there are transition points, right? You're young business, you're growing. Your first transition point is going to be to get new equity. You're not quite ready to go public, but the new equity will come from venture capitalists. At every one of these transition points, you're going to face trade-offs. Should I do that? Because there'll always be a cost to making the transition. You're a young private business. I'm the venture capitalist. You come to me for some money. I'll extract my pound of flesh, right? You know what I mean by my pound of flesh? If your company is worth a million and I'm providing you with 200,000, 
from a fair standpoint, what percentage of the company should you give me? 20% of your company, right? I'm going to demand 35. That's the trade-off. If you want that venture capitalist to come in, you have to give up more than his fair share of the business to get that venture capitalist in. Then when you go from being a private company funded by venture capitalists to a public company, there's another trade-off. Public companies have information disclosure requirements, your board of directors have to be constructed a certain way. You have to weigh that trade-off against the benefits of replacing these venture capitalists who are demanding a disproportionate share of the equity with public stockholders who might be willing to accept a more fair share. Then a public company that decides to issue more debt or more equity. So called seasoned offerings. You have to worry about issuance costs. So at every stage in the process, as you transition, you have to decide whether that next stage is worth it. And you might delay doing it, but at some stage, the benefits of making the transition, transition will exceed the cost, and you're going to make that transition. So let's think about this financing mix question. First, let's get the measures down. We've talked about debt to equity ratios, debt ratios. So let's revisit the way we define and measure debt. When we did debt for cost of capital, I said I'm going to include only interest-bearing debt and lease commitments in there. I'm going to stay with that definition. And when I talked about equity, at least up to the down of the class, I talked about market value of equity, share price times number of shares as opposed to book equity. The reason I emphasize that is you go to Bloomberg and you look up the debt ratio of your company, or Yahoo Finance and look up the debt ratio, the debt ratio you will see for your company will almost always be a book debt ratio, book equity and book debt, and God only knows what they've defined as debt. I think even in the Nike case, you looked at that balance sheet, some of you came up with 660 million in debt, some of you came up with 4 billion in debt. Why? Because there's all this kind of fuzzy items, right? It's had long-term liabilities, you weren't sure whether it was debt or something else. And you followed the accounting rule, be conservative, include everything in debt. So the key, the first step in this process is be careful about what you call debt and stay consistent with that. In fact, from this point on, whenever I say the word debt ratio, here's what I mean. I mean all interest-bearing debt and lease commitments as debt, and I'm going to always talk in terms of market value. So when I say the optimal debt ratio for Disney is 30%, I'm talking about the optimal market value debt ratio for Disney being 30%. The book debt ratio be 30%? No, it's going to be some other number, but I don't care. Because from my perspective, all that matters when you talk about financing mix is the percentage of the market value of the firm that comes from debt and the percentage from equity. So file that away because otherwise you're going to say, what did he mean by debt ratio? You know exactly from this point that when I say debt ratio, I'm talking about debt to capital. Market value, debt to capital. If I want to talk about debt to equity, I will be explicit that this one, we're going to use the debt to equity because we do need both ratios to do our analysis. So let's set up the question. So we look at our business. The question we're asking is, is there an optimal mix of debt and equity for the business? That sounds like a stupid question. You think, of course there is. There's actually an entire school of thought in finance which argues that there is no optimal mix. And we'll look at that school. It's called the Milo Modigliani School. It essentially says it doesn't matter how much you borrow. But if you decide that there is an optimal mix, then you've got to fill in the rest of the, the answer. Tell me what that mix is. So what I'd like to do is, as a start, a start up for this process is set up the trade-off. What are the benefits of borrowing money? And what are the costs? So we'll go through the benefits and the costs. And initially, it's going to be all qualitative. And you're going to say, well, I need a number. And you're right. We ultimately have to come up with a quantitative way of doing it. But let's start with a qualitative trade-off. So here are the benefits and costs of borrowing money as opposed to using equity. Okay? The first I'm sorry, let's set it up. There are two benefits that I'm going to talk about for debt. The first is a tax benefit. We've talked around this all through this class, but the tax benefit reflects the fact that the tax laws are skewed towards you borrowing money. When you borrow money, you get an interest tax savings you do not get when you use equity. That's the biggest benefit of debt. The second benefit of debt is going to be a little more mysterious. I'm going to argue that at least in some companies, debt can be used as a way to make managers more disciplined in the way they pick projects. So how can borrowing money make you more disciplined? We'll talk about that. It's actually a very strange argument, but in some companies, the argument actually makes sense. So tax benefits and added discipline. On the other side of the equation, I'm going to present three costs associated with borrowing money. The first is a bankruptcy cost. 
When you borrow money, I don't care how great, big you are, you could be Exxon Mobil with a huge amount of earnings, but if you borrow money, the probability that you will go bankrupt now is higher than it was before you borrowed the money. It might have gone from 0.0001% to 0.0003%, but there's an expected bankruptcy cost you got to weigh in. The second cost I want to talk about with borrowing money is an agency cost, reflecting the fact that what's good for equity investors might not be what's good for lenders, and that starts to play out in some very strange ways as a company has higher costs. And the third cost I want to talk about is the loss of flexibility. What I mean by that is it's always nice to hold back on borrowing money. It's always nice to have excess debt capacity because you can borrow the money if you really need it. If you go out and borrow the money today, you've used up that loss, that flexibility. So I'm going to take each of these items, and with each one, let's think about the implications for what you should expect to see as debt ratios across companies, across countries. So let's start with the first one. As I said, the big tax benefit of debt is built into the tax law. And this is true around the world. It's more true in some countries than others, like in the, as in the U.S. In other countries, they try to provide some, some kind of balance, but even in those countries, there is a tax benefit to debt. In the U.S., the tax benefit of debt shows up as the interest tax savings you get when you have an interest expense. That's why when we did the cost of debt for cost of capital, we took the pre-tax cost of debt and multiplied by 1 minus the tax rate, right? And we used the marginal tax rate. So the higher the marginal tax rate, the greater the tax savings. So the implication is actually very simple. If you're a company that faces a high marginal tax rate, I would expect other things remaining equal, I'd expect to see a lot more debt on your balance sheet. So let's, let's take that and, 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 and run with it. Let's first look at debt ratios across countries. If I gave you the debt ratios for Irish companies versus German companies, holding all else constant, you should expect to see much higher debt ratios in German companies than Irish companies because the marginal tax rate in Germany is 29.5%. The marginal tax rate in Ireland is only 12%. So you tell me your marginal tax rate, I can already start guessing about what kind of debt ratio you should find. You know what the marginal tax rate in much of the Middle East is? The corporate tax rate? It's actually 0%. If your marginal tax rate is 0%, I should expect, from a corporate finance standpoint, I should expect to see either very little debt or no debt on your balance sheet because I've taken away the biggest single benefit of borrowing. You say, but within, every, within any given market, isn't the marginal tax rate the same for all companies? It's generally true that if you look at U.S. companies, the marginal tax rate for almost all U.S. companies is about 40%. There are a couple of exceptions, though. One of the exceptions is when you look at REITs, Real Estate Investment Trust. For those of you not familiar with REITs, REITs were created by a tax law change about 30 years ago where if you decided to start a real estate investment trust and invest in it, the income the REIT made was not taxed. He's saying, this is great. Why doesn't everybody start REITs? In exchange for not taxing you on your income, you are required to pay out 95% of your earnings as dividends. So what the IRS is saying, if we don't tax you at the entity level, but you have to pay your earnings out as dividends, and when they get paid out as dividends, we'll tax the people getting the dividends. But at the entity level, real estate investment trusts pay no taxes. You can also set up real estate corporations, which are much more conventional entities, and if you have a real estate corporation, you actually have to pay the 35 40% tax rate. So here's my first question. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's assume you're, you're looking at REITs versus real estate corporations. Okay. You have the marginal tax rate of 40% for real estate corporations and 0% for REITs. This is, this is going to sound like a slam dunk, but there's a little, more, little nuance in here. Let's see if we can get it. Okay. If you base it purely on corporate taxes, you'd expect to see REITs borrow no money and real estate corporations borrow a ton of money, right? Because of the tax benefit. But what are we missing when you make that statement? REITs actually do have debt on the balance sheets. Many REITs borrow money. So where is the tax benefit coming to a REIT if it's not at the corporate level? What did I say REITs have to do? They have to pay 95% of their net income as dividends, right? Net income. Which means if you borrow money, guess what you do? You reduce your net income you're essentially getting the tax savings and interest expenses, but you know who's getting the tax savings? The investors in your company. 
So if the investors in your company all have 40% tax rates, indirectly REITs might still get the tax benefit. It's a little messy because you're saying, why don't we do that with every company? We, we don't generally because it's not too messy. But with REITs, you've got to be careful because based purely on the corporate tax rate, you're saying, why would they ever borrow money? But then you look at the investors holding stock in REITs, you could see why they might still get a benefit from borrowing money. So those REITs that are held by high-income individuals who pay higher tax rates should end up borrowing more money than those REITs that are held by pension funds that might pay no taxes. So it's a pass-through tax benefit. It does mess up the equation, but it still shows that the tax benefits of debt are a function of what you have as a tax rate. So that's the first group of U.S. companies, or companies that are traded in the U.S., that pay very little or no taxes at the entity level. The other group are cruise lines. Hey, have you ever been on a cruise? I've been on one cruise, the last cruise I'll ever be on. It's a boring place to be. Hey, they feed you consistently all the way through. But one of the interesting things about a cruise is how they charge you. First, you look at where they're incorporated. Most of them are incorporated in places you couldn't find on a globe. The only thing they share in common is that they have no taxes. Right? I mean, it could be Panama. It could, I mean, you can find Panama on a globe, but they're small places, and obviously Liberia. Um, you, you pick them because you don't pay taxes. But remember, you can be incorporated in a place that pays no taxes, but the way the tax law works is you get taxed on where you make your income. So if you're incorporated in the Cayman Islands, but you sell all your stuff in the U.S., you still have to pay the U.S. tax rate. You know how cruise lines get around this? First thing they, get, they do as soon as you get on the boat is they ask for your credit card, right? Right as you ch check in. And then they put it on file. And then about, they wait till you're about 10 to 12 miles off the coastline before they start charging you. Then they claim, hey, look, it's on the high seas. We're not in the U.S. We're not in Mexico. So it allows them to actually pay a much lower tax rate. If any of you are doing cruise lines for your uh, project, take a look at the effective tax rate. You see 2%, 3%, 3.5%. Reflecting the fact that they don't get taxed very much. And if you carry that to the logical limit, then you should expect cruise line companies to borrow a lot less money than other companies because they get a far smaller tax benefit from debt. So the biggest driver of tax benefits is that differential between how cash flow, uh, interest expenses are treated and how equity cash flows are treated. In the U.S., equity cash flows have to come out of after-tax, you know. So if you pay a dividend, it has to come out of after-tax income. You get no tax benefit when you pay a dividend. There are some countries in the world, as I said, which have tried to even the playing field a little bit. I'll give you one example. In Brazil, you're allowed to claim a tax deduction item called interest on capital. So what the heck is that? You're allowed to take your book value of equity if you're a Brazilian company. And every other government will give you a percentage. This year, let's say it's 12%. You're allowed to take 12% of the book value of equity and claim it as a tax deduction this year to make it more even. So just as you claim an interest tax savings, you can claim 12% of your book equity. It's not quite complete as a tax saving because your book equity might be much lower than your market equity, but it was their attempt to bring it back into steady state because the tax laws in most countries are skewed towards that. So that's the first step in the process. What are my tax benefits to borrowing money? The higher the marginal tax rate, the greater the benefits to borrowing money. I don't care what your effective tax rate is. You could have a 15% effective tax rate, but I still care about the marginal tax rate because that's where you're going to get the savings. Second benefit. Debt can make some managers more disciplined about the way they put projects. Let me back up. Let's assume you're the managers of an all-equity funded company. It's a very mature company. It's got lots of earnings and cash flows coming in. Billions. And you're the manager of this company. I'm going to argue that as managers of this all-equity funded mature company, you're going to be tempted to become lazy. What I mean by that is, if you take a bad project, who's going to notice? You just hide it under your earnings and cash flows? So you know how I'm going to make you more disciplined? I'm going to force you to borrow several billion dollars. Right, so you think, that's absurd. Why would that make me more disciplined? If you borrow money, you've got to make interest expenses on that debt, right? Now if you go out and take bad projects, you know what might happen? You might be unable to make those interest expenses, in which case you go bankrupt. And you lose it. It's an extreme way of getting somebody's attention. But if that's the only way I can get your attention, I'm going to try it. 
I call this the Volvo argument for debt. Let me explain why I call this the Volvo argument for debt. Let's say it's five years out. You've got your MBA. You joined some I know, investment bank. You've risen up the ranks. You're now a managing director. You moved into the suburbs. You bought this big house. Two cars, two dogs, two spouses, whatever makes you happy. Just to do all. Okay? And every day you take the train into work from whichever suburb you're in. So you, drive, you live only five minutes away from the train station, so you drive your car, you park it in the station, you get on the train, you come into work. So let's give your car some characteristics. Your first car is a Volvo. Volvo, extra armored, you know what I'm talking about? Front airbags, it's like driving a tank around town. Your second car is some kind of a tin trap. I don't want to insult anybody's car, so let me pick a model that nobody, have. how about a Yugo? Does anybody have a Yugo here? Okay, good. Hey. So you got a Volvo and a Yugo. So first day, you get into your Volvo, it's your lucky day. You get to drive the Volvo to the train station. Six o'clock in the morning, you drive to the train station, you park the car, you get on the train, you go to work. You work all day, you work all evening, you work all night. Ten o'clock at night, you get back home. You're exhausted, you just want to get home. So you crawl to your, you can't even walk anymore, you're that exhausted. You crawl to your Volvo, you climb in. Maybe you live only five minutes away, right? So you can try to zoom home. But between the train station and your house, there's a traffic light, which if it turns red, takes forever to turn back to green. So you pull up to the top of the hill, and just as you get there, the light turns red. And you say, oh, drat. Those would not be exactly the words you use, but I'm censoring as I'm going along. And as you sit there watching the red light, illegal thoughts start crossing your mind, right? You say, what if I ran that red light? There's two things you worry about with the red light. One is getting a ticket. But you're in the suburbs, 10 o'clock at night, the police have all gone home. So you don't worry about the ticket. The other is getting hit, right? But then you remember you're in your Volvo extra armored. What do you care about getting hit? You get hit, you get a little dent on the side, the other guy's all crumpled up. It's his problem, you run the red light. You make it home safe. Next day you repeat the process, but today you're in your Yugo. Well, going to work at 6, you work all day, work all evening, 10 o'clock at night, you climb into Yugo, you get to the top of the light turns red again. It's like a conspiracy. And as you sit there getting ready to hit the gas pedal and go through the red light, you remember what you did yesterday. You say, hey, I ran the red light yesterday. I can do it again. Then you remember you're no longer in your Volvo. You're in your Yugo. You say, what am I thinking? A guy in a bicycle comes along and hits me. I could roll off the road. <laughs> and you stop. Think about it. I mean, in fact, you say, what's this got to do with that? And I think of the Volvo <coughs> as an all-equity funded company and the airbags as cash cushions. I protected you so much, you didn't care. Think of the red light as a bad project. You know why you ran the red light? Because you were so protected, you didn't care. Think of the Yugo as the same company. Stripped off its cash, borrowing a ton of money, and think of why you stopped for the red light, because you were afraid of getting hurt. That's really the core of this argument, is that if I want you to behave in a disciplined way, I have to raise the stakes for you. And one way to raise the stakes is by going out and borrowing a ton of money. It's called the Jensen free cash flow argument for debt. Same Jensen attached his name to Alphas. It's Jensen free cash flow argument for debt. And he made this argument in the 1980s to justify leverage buyouts. He said, this is why we're seeing leverage buyouts. His leverage buyouts are the market's mechanism for disciplining bad managers at mature companies. And you know what? The argument had a core of truth, but I never thought you could push it that far. Because in a leverage buy, you don't just borrow money, right? You borrow way more than you can afford to borrow. At the risk of stretching that car analogy one final step, it's like taking the Yugo into the dealer. And even Yugos come with little air balloons that are not quite big enough to be bagged. So in the event of an accident, you've got to go forward to meet it. And replacing them with air knives. Have you seen one of these? You get in an accident, a knife comes right out of the steering wheel. Then ask yourself, would I ever drive that car? It's going to sit in the driveway, right? That's what happens when companies borrow too much money. Every mistake could be your absolute last one, so you get paralyzed. So you don't want that to happen to companies either. So there's this happy compromise you're looking for that's between the Volvo and the Air Knife. And that's one way to think about how much should I borrow is where is that happy compromise? So with that argument for debt being a mechanism to discipline managers, let me offer you a couple of different groups of or three different sets of companies and you tell me in which one of these companies or which one of these groups 
Debt makes the most sense as a mechanism to get managers to do the right thing. So all of these companies are very little debt. They're all mature companies, but the first are privately owned businesses. Do you think it makes sense for a privately owned business? You're the owner of a private business. Does it make sense for you to borrow money to make yourself more disciplined? Not unless you're self-destructed. This is your own business. What are you doing taking bad projects? So if you're a privately owned business, it makes zero chance, zero sense to argue that you're borrowing money to make yourself more disciplined. What if you're a, public, you know, a very little debt company, mature company, stocks are held by millions of investors or tens of thousands of investors as opposed to a company that is held by you know, some institutional investors, some of whom are activist institutional investors, a KKR or Blackstone. Which of those two groups do you think is a better candidate for, for forcing debt on them? Why do we use debt again? To monitor, to make sure managers don't do stupid things, right? They don't take bad projects. If you have a KKR or a Blackstone looking over your shoulder, you might not need to borrow money. So if you have activist investors, you might not need the debt to make you more disciplined. So you know where debt makes the most sense? is in companies where you feel U.S. stockholders have lost control of the company. The man is running the company for themselves. You ask them to go out and borrow money. So the argument for debt as a mechanism to discipline managers is probably going to be greater at large, mature companies where you don't have any large activist investors in the mix. When we looked at the HDS page, a company like Coca-Cola, there isn't a single investor on that group that we saw. Actually, Coca-Cola is a bad example because there was an investor on that group, right? Who's in the Coca-Cola top 17 list who might? Berkshire Hathaway is, is one of the largest stockholders in Coca-Cola. But if you look, looked at Procter & Gamble, none of the top seven... Procter & Gamble, too, is Berkshire Hathaway. Never mind, that, that couldn't go off the list as well. Right? Look at Con Ed, top 17 investors. Not a single one is an activist investor. So if you don't see any activist investors in that group, it's a large company, stock holdings are you know, dispersed widely, you might argue for the use of debt in that company to get the company to do what it should be doing. So tax benefits and added discipline go on the plus side of the ledger. Let's look at the other side of the ledger. Let's talk about bankruptcy costs. Every company, when it borrows money, increases its exposure to bankruptcy how great you are as a company. And there are two items I'm going to look at to come up with the expected bankruptcy cost. One is the probability that you will go bankrupt. If you're a company with more volatile cash flows, more volatile earnings, and riskier businesses, I would expect you to be more exposed to that risk than if you're in a safe business with predictable cash flows. The other is the cost of going bankrupt. This sounds like a stupid question, but humor me anyway. What's the cost of going bankrupt? First, what's the director? Once you declare bankruptcy, what happens to you? Where do you end up? You end up in bankruptcy court, right? You end up in the legal system, generically. A very efficient system. No, but you, I, I became a citizen of the United States about 15 years ago. And to show you how delusional I was, about six months after I became a, a citizen, I get this letter in the mail giving me one of my duties as a citizen, which is an invitation to be on a jury. And I was actually excited about it. I said, this is this exciting, my first chance to be a citizen. So they had marked the date down on my calendar. I show up, and I walk in, and this is an extraordinarily bored-looking person sitting at a table. And I say, I've come to my jury duty. She says, she throws it into the box, go sit down. I said, what do I do? Watch the terminal. What am I looking for? Your number. What do I do if it doesn't show up? Come back again tomorrow. I said, I can't keep coming back every day. I have, to, I have a job to do. He says, no, don't worry about it. We pay $8 a day. So said, okay, that settles it. I'll come back for the rest of eternity. Okay? Which tells you something about how the legal system values everybody's time other than the lawyers, which is your time is worth nothing. Just hang around. Somewhere in the next three years, we'll get around to you. That's the system you end up with once you go bankrupt. Study that looked at railroads that went bankrupt in the 1970s found that between the time these railroads declared bankruptcy, every U.S. railroad pretty much went bankrupt in the 1970s. That's how we created Amtrak, is by consolidating those private railroads. So this study actually focused on these railroads and looked at how much time it took between the time the railroads declared bankruptcy and creditors in the railroad actually got paid. You know the average length was? About seven years. Between declaring bankruptcy 
entering the court system and proceeds starting to be used to pay off creditors. Seven years. And during those seven years, forget about just the present value effect. During those seven years, you know who's getting paid every year, right? It's the only group that's getting paid. Bankruptcy lawyers. Look at the priority of claims in bankruptcy. First claim goes to the U.S. government for taxes due. Right below them are bankruptcy lawyers. How the heck did they get in there? Here I am owed money for 25 years. I go to the back of the line. Could things change? Well, I'll tell you, they're not going to change in the right direction because about 10 years ago, Congress started rewriting these bankruptcy laws. They called in, I think, 30 witnesses. There's a congressional committee saying, how should we rewrite the bankruptcy laws? They call in 30 witnesses. 29 of them are bankruptcy lawyers. The law is getting rewritten. They're not moving down the list. They're probably saying, does the U.S. government have to get taxes first? Couldn't we be first on the list? I mean, what I'm trying to say is once you declare bankruptcy, you enter this process where 20, 30, 35% of your assets could end up going to the lawyers. Do you see what the Lehman legal bill was in the, in the Lehman bankruptcy? I think it had $2 billion about six months ago. $2 billion in legal costs associated with the liquidation. This is not a cheap process. That's what's called the direct or deadweight cost. Is once you declare bankruptcy, that's where you end up. But that's if that were the only cost, I would be okay with companies borrowing a lot more money. You know what really scares me? Is the perception that you might go bankrupt. If you get into enough trouble that people start talking about you being in trouble, then you're in trouble, right? Do you see what I mean? Let's suppose you're a company. And the new story starts spreading that you're in financial trouble. Think about all the negative consequences. First, your customers stop buying your products, right? They say, well, no, well, you'll be around. I can't, no, I can't get servicing for my products. I'll stop buying a product. I remember in 1980 when Chrysler, the rumors started going around that Chrysler would not be around. And Chrysler car dealerships. People stopped coming in. They said, I can't buy a Chrysler and not be able to get the parts for the car. So your customers start buying your products. Your suppliers start doing what if they know you're in trouble? They start demanding cash. They're saying, no credit for you. Your employees start checking out monster.com or LinkedIn for our new jobs while they're sitting at their desk saying, hey, I don't know. In other words, once you start getting into trouble, you start spiraling into even more trouble. I call that an indirect bankruptcy cost. And that cost can be huge. It can be greater for some companies than others. And if that cost is a very large cost and you want to stay as far away as you can from that, from that edge, because if you borrow money and people start talking about your incapacity to make those debt payments, you could very quickly spiral out of control. So other things remaining equal, companies with more volatile earnings, with a higher property bankruptcy should borrow less than companies with more stable earnings. And companies with higher indirect bankruptcy costs should borrow less than companies with lower indirect bankruptcy costs. Now you might wonder, why would indirect bankruptcy cost vary across companies? Let me give you a very simple choice, and you can already see it in play. Let's assume you're looking at you know, three companies. Let's go give the company's name. A grocery store, let's say Safeway. An airplane manufacturer, let's say Boeing. And let's say a high technology company, let's pick Intel. And you're trying to decide, based only on bankruptcy costs, which one of these companies is likely to have the lowest expected bankruptcy cost and which one is going to have the highest expected bankruptcy cost? Let's go with the easy one first. Which one of these three companies do you think has the lowest expected bankruptcy cost? Good. And what is it about a grocery store that makes the bankruptcy cost low? First, let's look at the revenue, the, uh, the, the, the probability side. Your revenues or earnings are more predictable because you provide a more non-discretionary product. Right? You don't see grocery store revenues dropping 50%. They might drop 5%, they might go up. So you have more stable revenues and earnings. So you should be able to borrow money. Let's look at the other side of the equation, the cost of bankruptcy. The direct cost might be the direct cost, but let's think about the indirect cost. I don't know about you, but I don't walk into a grocery store, stop just as I enter and say, is this a triple C rated grocery store? I don't care. It's not like I plan to bring the lettuce back in five years. If I have a problem, I'm going to be back tomorrow. There's no servicing needed. Suppliers give you, give you credit for what, two or three days. So this is a business where the indirect bankruptcy costs are going to be very small. 
which means other things remaining equal, I would expect grocery stores to borrow far more money for a given level of operating income than the other two companies. Now let's look at the other two companies. Okay? Airline manufacturer, let's take Boeing. Okay? Have you seen what a typical contract for Boeing looks like? 15, Singapore Air agrees to buy 15 Dreamliners over the next 12 years. It's a big contract over a really long time period, right? They would never sign that contract with Boeing if it were a double B rated company. Why? You don't want to put your fate as an airline in the hands of a company that might not be around in three years. Which means a perception of trouble in Boeing could be devastating because all those airlines are going to step back and say, we'll buy it from Airbus instead. They're subsidized or supported by the European government. They're going to be around. So we'd much rather do business with them. The indirect bankruptcy cost at Boeing are going to be large enough that the expected bankruptcy cost at Boeing is going to be high. And I think the expected bankruptcy cost at Intel are probably going to be high as well. A couple of reasons. One is that it's in a risky business. No matter how big you are as a technology company, you can't count on revenues and earnings. In fact, um, I, I got an email last week from somebody who was thinking about doing a leverage buyout of research in motion. I said, forget about the leverage, do the buyout. The two don't have to be linked up. Do you see why? Because unlike a grocery where you are going to buy food for this, there is no guarantee when you, when you buy a company like Research in Motion that even though the Blackberry is a cash cow right now, that will continue to be a cash cow for the long term. So things are far less predictable in the technology business, which is part of the reason. Those of you doing technology companies, even big ones, if you look at your debt ratios, they tend to be 3%, Microsoft 5%, Apple 0%. Now we can argue that these companies should borrow more money, but they can't borrow 60, 70, 80% of the value because they're in much riskier businesses. So start thinking about your company for your big projects. Start thinking in terms of bankruptcy costs, both the probability of bankruptcy and the cost of bankruptcy, because they're both going to feed in to that debt decision. So if you if you if you bring this to fruition then, looking at these three companies for the same, let's say they all have the same operating income, I would expect the grocery store to have much higher debt than the technology company or the airplane manufacturer. Okay. In fact, some of the most successful leverage buyouts done in the 1980s were done in grocery stores because there you can borrow money, push your rating down to triple C and survive. You could never do that with an airplane manufacturer or a technology company. A leverage buyout of a semiconductor company is asking for trouble. Okay. So when you look at businesses that you do see leverage transactions on, you want to make sure you do leverage transactions only on businesses where you have stable earnings and fairly low indirect bankruptcy costs. So that's the first and biggest cost of borrowing money is a bankruptcy cost. Here's the second cost, an agency cost. You know what an agency cost is? Anytime you ask somebody else to do something for you, you have an agency problem. You know what? Because they don't care about you as much as you care about you. Nobody does. I'll give you a classic example of an agency cost. Okay. It's late at night, you're sitting around as a group. You're working on your group project. You decide it's time for dinner, but it, you don't want to break up. So you send one of the people in the group to the, the local uh, campus eatery or wherever. Say, pick up sandwiches. And you're very specific about what you'd like. Say, make sure... You get ham on wheat, no mayo, lots of mustard. You know what you come back with? Roast beef on white with lots of mayo. Because he, he got up to the front of the line and said, what did she want again? Who cares? It's not my sandwich. I'll get whatever I feel like getting. It's an agency problem. An agency problem with a fairly minor cost because you just skipped dinner that night. Here's another agency problem. How many of you have kids? Anybody? Kids here? I have four now. They're all grown up. But I remember when they were small and used to hire a babysitter. Classic agency problem. The babysitter shows up at about 7 o'clock. You turn things over to it. Say, you know, we'll be back by 10. Make sure the kids are in bed. And don't feed them after 9. Especially nothing sugary. And you leave. You know exactly what's going to happen, right? 9, 10, 9, 15. The kids, they sense this weakness in the house. They come down from their room saying, I'd like some ice cream. And your babysitter's watching Gossip Girls or whatever, and it's in the middle of the show. And she has two choices. She can fight them for the remaining 45 minutes and say, no, you can't have ice cream. 
Or she can say, oh, you know what, these are not my kids. Just feed them the ice cream. I'm going to be gone at 10 o'clock anyway. So you come back at 10 o'clock, they're bouncing off the walls. You say, what the heck happened here? Lost night of sleep and all the things that go with it. That's a classic agency problem. And there are two solutions to the agency problem, right? One is to build it into your cost, which is to say, look, if we go out, then we don't sleep. Which basically means you reduce the number of times you go out. So that's, that's building the cost. You know what the other solution is? It's a monitoring solution. What would that require? That would require cameras set up all over your house. Tracking the kids and the babysitter, and you to carry around something we can watch what's going on. There's probably an iPad app for it now. So you sit there watching, oh my God, she's feeding them ice cream. Let's get back home right away. So what's this got to do with debt and equity? Let's play a game. You guys are going to be equity investors. You guys are going to be the bank. They're going to come to you to borrow money. So when you go to borrow money from the bank, how do you describe the projects you're going to fund with your borrowing, safe or risky? Safe. safe. Very safe projects. I look after the money as if it's my own. Let's say you're a trusting banker, which is an oxymoron, but let's say you're a trusting banker. Right? Trusting bankers don't say bankers for long. So you, tr so you say, you look very honest. Here's $5 billion. No strings attached. Why? Because you, they looked honest. Now that you have the $5 billion as equity investors, tell me, do you think your incentives now might be different? You told the bank you were going to take nice, safe projects with this money, right? But now that you have the money with no strings attached, might you not be tempted to take far riskier projects? See why, right? Because if you take far riskier projects and you get upside, who gets the upside? You do. If there's downside, they get the downside. This is a great game to play. So once you borrow the money, you take far riskier projects than the projects you described. You might pay yourself a dividend, buy back stock. You could do all kinds of things with the cash. That's why you're not a trusting banker, right? So when you lend them the money, what do you do to prevent them from doing these stupid things? Have you ever seen a bank loan agreement? It's basically things you cannot do. Don't do that, don't do that, don't even think about doing that, don't even dream about doing that. So basically, you write in covenants into the debt. Then you hire lawyers to monitor the covenants because the covenants are not going to watch out for themselves. You say, this is all the banker's cost. I don't care. Guess who actually pays for those lawyers? You do as the borrowers. The banker doesn't have to pay. He basically passes it on through a higher interest cost. A higher... In other words, you either build in the assumption that the equity investors are going to take it to the cleaners by charging a higher interest rate, or you build into the cost, and they ultimately are borne by the borrowers, not the lenders. That's what we mean about agency costs. And the higher your agency cost, the less money you will borrow. You see, do we all face the same agency cost? As a banker, you might feel more comfortable lending to some types of companies than others. I'll give you an example. Let's assume you are lending to a real estate company. You know what makes you feel more comfortable? It shouldn't, but you know what makes you feel more comfortable? Your loans create this building, right? You can drive around the building and say, that's the building that my debt created. But in contrast, if you're lending to a pharmaceutical company, what are they borrowing the money to do? Research and development, right? How the heck do you monitor that? And for all you know, they're building these glass buildings, pulling people off the streets, putting white coats on them, say, walk around the building, look busy. And you're on the outside saying, they're doing research and development in there. You have no monitoring it. Which means when you're lending money to a company that has a lot of intangible assets, assets you cannot see, you're far more worried about this agency problem than when you lend to a company with tangible assets, assets you can look at and say, that's what my loan created. So you know what that implies, right? Companies with intangible assets, other things remaining equal, will be able to borrow less money than companies with tangible physical assets. Another reason why technology companies will generally have lower debt ratios than manufacturing companies. Pharmaceutical companies in the US are notorious for maintaining low debt ratios. Here's another reason. Your physical assets are fairly small. If you don't have the physical assets, you can't borrow as much money. So if you carry that to the next step, you can already see why different companies will end up borrowing different amounts of money. So last slide for the day, if you think about lending to a large technology firm or a large regulated utility, you can see why you're far more likely to lend to a large regulated utility because it has more physical assets, 
And you know what else you have going for you? What's the other thing you worry about? That they'll do stupid things with your money? If you're a large regulated utility, there's a regulatory authority kind of keeping their reins on them. It makes your life easier. So start thinking about the trade-off for your company. But remember, your quiz comes first on, on Wednesday. charge at a higher interest rate, but they don't have right. You're assuming that a Chinese bank yeah. will charge Nike a country default spread when it lends money to Nike. And I, my argument is, if a Chinese bank lends to Nike, they lend to them as a U.S. company. Oh, okay. Okay? So that's my point, that's is that, okay. right, so that you will not be paid, because the argument that some people are using is, if you're borrowing in China, you have to pay the Chinese default yeah. spread. And my point is, it's not going to happen. A Chinese bank, when it lends to a U.S. company, it lending to Coca-Cola G, lends to the U.S. company. It charges a default risk for the company, but not a default risk for the company. But do these companies have entities that are registered in China? They're not. They're not private subsidiaries. They don't. They don't. They're actually part. I mean, GE is GE. There's no GE local which has its own. Debt rating. Most of them, some of them, some that, right? of them do. But yeah. They do. They have that there because of the legal requirement. Oh. They, were for, they were forced to divest yeah. themselves oh. of their Indian holdings when they got out of it in the, the 70s. 70s right, yeah. So a lot of multinationals in India have Indian subsidiaries because that's the only way they could do it. Okay. And in that case, they would be charged. The then they, the then it's no longer. Then it's actually a local company. It's an Indian company. An Indian company. Right. So you don't even have this issue. So Nike, when it does its apparel business in China, could choose to set up a subsidiary in China. Yeah. But there are all kinds of other issues that will come with that. Right? They lose control of it. Yeah. Right? They won't be able to control So the voting shares then will be held by whoever the share holds shares in Nike China. So that's the trade-off. If you set up a subsidiary, it's a publicly traded company, it's a chart its own plans, right. which are very different from the parent company. So in the project, if we had just not taken the country risk premium and the debt and assumed that spread the, over For the, the debt, at least, I wouldn't take in the country risk because it doesn't make sense to actually do that unless you start creating subsidiaries, but that will create a whole set of other issues. And that makes sense only if you decide to do each slide separately, then. not as you do consolidate that. Yes? Yes, I have another project. Can I show the numbers? or? This is the infinite one. And uh, where's the five? Let me go back to it. Show me the finite life case. Okay, so finite life case. So that's the cash flow. So all I'm checking for is see this bottom line on the finite life case? Yes. Whether that's the same cash flow you have in the infinite life case. And it looks to me like they're the same. So tell Yes, me from zero to 12, right? That's all that matters, right? So basically, you can't just wake up on the, at the start of your 13 and change things, right? Because you're 0 to 12, if you don't put in any capital maintenance, guess no. what you've done to your assets, right? Yeah, but here the problem we put in the two. Yeah. Oh, you're the same. 